Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to this special webinar, uh, launch webinar of our newest projectors, XDM and XDX. Uh, my name is Richard Marples, and I work in the entertainment division here at Barco uh, in the headquarters in Belgium. Yeah, and I'm Kun van Dalle, product manager for fixed installation projectors here at Barco. So thanks for joining us here on the Blue Loop platform. Uh, thank you to Blue Loop for making it available. Um, we hope that you find the presentation both interesting and entertaining. We'll do our best. Um, it should last about 45 minutes. So let's get on with it. Um, first of all, before we begin, um, a very quick overview of Barco for those of you that don't know us. So Barco designs technology to enable outcomes, bright outcomes all around the world. Our headquarters are here in Belgium where our story began as a small radio company in the 1930s. Today, we're a publicly listed company of about 3,400 employees. We're present in more than 30 countries and we've got R&D and or manufacturing sites and spread all over the globe. On the right hand side, you can see the geographical breakdown of our sales. Uh, Barco, B-A-R-C-O, actually stands for the Belgian American Radio Corporation. And it began in 1934 uh, by a, an entrepreneur importing radio components from the United States to build radios. Those very old fashioned kind in wooden cabinets with lots of valves inside. That was almost 90 years ago. Barco today is made up of three main divisions, entertainment, healthcare, and enterprise. Entertainment, as the name implies, handles everything that keeps you entertained and is by far the most interesting and exciting, uh, purely from an unbiased point of view, of course. Um, our main products in entertainment are projectors, image processing systems uh, that we deliver into markets such as cinema, live events, themed entertainment, uh, but also simulation, high-end residential, and virtual and augmented reality. The enterprise division is everything that goes into corporate and government environments, uh, such as control rooms, meeting rooms, and collaboration, uh, using all kinds of technologies such as LCD, LED, rear projection, uh, and one of our better known products more recently, uh, ClickShare. Uh, we've also got recent innovations such as WeConnect, which is a digital learning platform for education and corporate establishments. Healthcare, as the name implies, provides uh, specialist solutions for visualizing medical images. Not only the special displays and monitors, but increasingly also the networked visualization systems that link all of these screens together. Uh, you can imagine that these displays need to be very accurate, sharp, and with zero latency. You don't want your surgeon to experience a problem when he's performing your keyhole surgery. You can see on the right-hand slide of the, of the chart uh, the split between the different divisions, and so it's confirmed entertainment is indeed the biggest as well as the best. So we're here today to launch two new projectors that are specifically aimed at the themed entertainment markets and build upon our recent success uh, in cinema, the SP4K projectors uh, that we developed specifically for the cinema market. But before we get into details about them, um, I first want to introduce some special guests who will tell us a bit more about what the current trends are in the market and just what is needed to make successful digital attractions uh, for themed entertainment. So first of all, we're going to be talking to Oliver Cully of Scallywag Entertainments Limited about general trends in the market. And then we'll hear from Thomas Gellerman of Craftwork Living Technologies, who will discuss the requirements with regards to technology in digital attractions. With the busy time schedules of everybody, different time zones around the world, and sometimes very dodgy internet connections, uh, we did take the precaution of pre-recording the two sessions with our invited guests. So what I'm going to do is play back those recorded interviews in just a moment. However, you'll be pleased to know that uh, those special guests will be joining us at the end, uh, live and online, 
to answer any questions that you may have. So you can uh, fire questions and they will answer them live. Um, so uh, exactly as was explained by Emma at the beginning. So first of all, we'll play the video with Ollie now. So first off, I would like to introduce Mr. Oliver Cully, who is the founder and CEO of Scallywag Entertainments Limited. Um, Ollie's got more than 18 years of experience in commercial real estate and location-based entertainment. He's formerly of Merlin Entertainments and was their business development director for APAC. He lives and works out of Hong Kong. His company supports operators and owners of attractions and intellectual property uh, and helps them expand their business in the region. Good morning, Ollie. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Good morning. So we've known each other for a few years now, and uh, last year, uh, Barcode commissioned some research from Scallywag Entertainments uh, to investigate Barcode's position in the projector market, as well as to understand more broadly the direction of location-based entertainment. Can you tell us what kind of research you carried out and uh, for Barco and with which kinds of companies? Yeah, so um, last year, it was sort of early last year, we uh, we did a fairly substantial online survey uh, seeking feedback from LBE companies of all sizes, uh, from theme park operators, FECs, aquarium, Aquaria, uh, arcades, esports, uh, as well as ride suppliers, system integrators, and service providers. Um, we were focused on the uh, senior level, senior level directors uh, and decision makers, primarily in technical and project management roles. Um, geographically, we were uh, diverse, covering all parts of the globe. Um, and of course, uh, as you would expect, we focused more mostly on Barco clients and partners. Um, but we also obtain feedback from companies not currently uh, using Barco products. Um, then we also undertook some fairly in-depth interviews with a smaller number of partners. Um, and with the results of both the survey and the interviews, uh, we were able to get uh, feedback across a fairly broad uh, array of issues. Um, we explored many areas, including equipment and attraction sourcing processes and challenges. Uh, with a particular focus on uh, on the use and experiences with uh, media equipment, uh, as well as media equipment manufacturers, um, uh, and then relating to both the purchase and ongoing maintenance. Um, we also discussed market trends, including relating to AV equipment in the attraction sector. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so you did this survey uh, initially at the beginning of 2020, um, which was at the beginning of the COVID impact. Um, can you tell us were there any trends that you identified? And could you perhaps give us a quick overview of what these were? And I believe we've got a couple of slides and I will attempt to start the slides whilst you begin talking. Yeah, thanks Richard. Yeah, at the time, I think we thought we hoped it was maybe halfway through the pandemic and that we were that we were, uh, you know, out uh, out through the worst of it. But um, unfortunately, looking back, we were really only at the beginning of it. So um, many of the uh, much of the feedback, many of the reactions we got from our uh, interviewees and survey respondees um, was based on a relatively uh, uh, short a small amount of data over a shorter period of time um, and um, some of the forecasts that they gave us um, were yeah, based on um, not so much experience on just predictions as to what would happen and of course now they have uh, a lot more information about those trends um, but some of the some of the key uh, predictions and some of the things that they had already been noticing were of course smaller groups uh, and attractions driven by social distancing um the uh touchless technology um as well as uh queuing processes so just in time um just in time entrance processes um also app based experiences um helping to continue experiences at home so those were the uh, i'd say those were the key trends that that came out of those discussions okay thanks 
And um, we recently asked you to uh, update this uh, research uh, on a smaller level, but to try and see uh, if there were any changes uh, happening in the market. So now more than one year later, um, is there anything new? What else have we learned in the meantime? Yeah, um, I would say uh, not not too much new, but what's I think been really uh, uh, now with with a benefit of hindsight and much much more uh, experience within this pandemic, um, we've been able to see um, with a lot more clarity uh, the the trends. Um, so to put it another day another way, there were no significant trends identified that were only related to COVID. I think that was one of the key things that has come out. So if we look at, for instance, touchless technology, of course, that was something that was happening uh, before COVID, but it was greatly accelerated by COVID. And we're now seeing a continuation of touchless technology. Um, uh, queue management, again, that was something that was already happening before, but uh, whereas uh, maybe a smaller number of attractions were doing a lot of work around queue management, now everyone is. So it was greatly accelerated by COVID. Um, so if we look at now at that customer behavior, there's a, a much greater willingness to uh, touch again uh, and to uh, and to queue. Um, but the improvements that have been made during COVID haven't gone away. And um, perhaps there have been uh, there have been and possibly will be a few steps back. Um, not quite such a focus on it, but the improvements that have been made certainly won't be going away uh, completely and are likely to continue um, being rolled out across attractions, maybe just at a slower pace as we hopefully pass past COVID. Um, so um, I would say that in summary, uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the trends that were identified were really um, trends that are linked. They have a strong basis in convenience rather than just safety. And because of that, they're likely to continue. Um, so one comment from one industry leader we spoke to was that the uh, about the new normal. They said the new normal is actually a fallacy. Um, there is no new normal. We will, uh, to some extent, we will revert to uh, our old normal, um, but just with acceleration of um, many of the trends that were already happening in the industry. Uh, my own opinion is that people have a relatively short memory. We're still very much in the midst of COVID now, but uh, I do feel that once people feel safe, uh, both customers and uh, attraction owners and operators will be seeking to return largely to the old normal, um, but they will embrace embrace convenience um, and things like contactless payments, touchless um, technology and so on is, is likely to continue more because of convenience than safety. OK, that's clear. Thank you. Um, so what does this mean for the future uh, of investments into things like dark rides and digital attractions? And um, what's changed there? I mean, I'd say the outlook for dark rides and digital attractions is still generally positive. Um, you know, technology in the short term probably doesn't need to change much to keep these experiences relevant and appealing to guests. Um, Media remains a, a key part of most attractions. Uh, hopefully, uh, maybe that I think we've got a slide for that one, Richard. But um, you know, most of the most of the people we talked to would, uh, told us that media was um, for. I think eighty percent of them told us that media was uh, a part of more than three quarters of all attractions in uh, that they were working on. Um, having said that, uh, you know, major dark ride manufacturers that we spoke to and system integrators working with dark rides had said that the sector is going through a, a really rough patch at the moment and they don't expect a significant improvement until later in 2022 or early 23 uh, and that many projects have been cut or, or on hold. Um, now there are some geographical differences. I think Asia has maybe fared better than elsewhere, particularly mainland China. Um, my own view is that's partly because theme parks in China are a means to an end. Uh, you know, most of the developers of theme parks in China are doing it as much to get surrounding land for real estate development, uh, selling off of apartments as they are for the theme parks themselves. So their core business is reliant on 
getting uh, you know, building theme parks. They, they need to build theme parks and they need to buy rides in order to get the land to make the big bucks on. Um, so I think uh, uh, possibly partly because of that, China has fared better. OK, that's clear. Thanks. And um, what do the owners and operators look for when deciding on technology investments? Uh, what are their key requirements uh, when making these important decisions? So I think the I think the fundamentals haven't changed. Um, you know, a great guest experience, um, the cost of purchasing equipment and the setup costs, um, the returns on investment and ease of maintenance are still the fundamental uh, requirements for investors. Um, so just to touch on these in a bit more detail, um, if we look at guest experience, um, the fundamental question for buyers is still whether the technology or ride will provide their guests with a positive experience, um, meeting or exceeding expectations. Um, and from for costs, um, the, the question that buyers are uh, always ask themselves and, and can still ask themselves is can this be done at a cost that makes sense? Um, can we justify the purchase price? Um, and and for many of many of these companies, can we get it approved by our investment committee? Um, from an ROI perspective, um, will the investment meet the returns required? Um, so for many uh, attraction companies, that means 20% plus potentially. Uh, I think we 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 identify an average of about 25% was the ROI expected from most uh, companies. Um, it does depend on the the brand and uh, how tested the technology is. So less tested tech, the the returns typically need to be higher. Um, for maintenance, how hard will, is the equipment uh, to install, uh, and what's the uh, uh, troubleshooting and maintenance uh, program like? Uh, is the buyer confident that the manufacturer or systems integrators can provide the necessary support, um, and especially with current travel restrictions, which have made things more complicated? Uh, so long distance maintenance, um, can it be maintained on site and uh, training of end users, which uh, is something that has always been important, but never to the extent it is now. Um, and um, training of uh, systems integrators and can systems integrators get the support they need um, so that the downtime of rides is reduced. Uh, so it's also linked with the lifetime of the technology. Um, in our survey, we identified that the preferred lifetime uh, of technology was six to eight years. And we see no change to this with COVID. Um, we might have been able to speculate that COVID might increase the requirements for lifetime of technology, but uh, we haven't really seen any. Um, that's sort of just uh, maintained at that level. Um, so the question is, is, is the technology going to last without substantial levels of direct maintenance, including replacement parts from the manufacturer or systems integrator? Um, and can the buyer be more self-sufficient during the lifetime of the investment? I think those are fairly fundamental, uh, particularly with travel restrictions the way they are. But again, similar with some of the other trends that we looked at, we uh, I think that uh, buyers of technology and rides and so on, um, they are going to have a greater expectation of being able to manage and maintain the, uh, the equipment uh, from a distance. And as I understand it, um, Barco and many, many technology uh, uh, manufacturers have massively stepped up their game in terms of their ability to, uh, to, to do that from a distance. So um, maybe that's a nice segue to, uh, to Barco to talk a bit about that. OK, thanks very much, Oli, for joining us. Thanks for your time uh, and the insights that you've given us. Um, I look forward to talking to you more at the end of the uh, uh, the webinar, uh, when maybe there'll be a few more questions. Uh, but thanks very much. Thanks, Richard. So um, I hope you found that insightful. Uh, now let's move to the technology part and hear from Thomas Gellerman from Craftwork and what he looks for when making amazing visit visitor attractions. 
I would like to introduce Mr. Thomas Gellerman, who is Head of Special Projects at Kraftwerk in Austria. Um, I would like to point out that we've invited Thomas to give his and his company's views on the themed entertainment market, uh, and specifically the technology that is used uh, within rides and attractions. Um, he's not here uh, to say whether or not Barco's news projectors uh, should be used or not. Um, you'll have to make your own minds up about that. Um, but Thomas can give us some very nice insights into the market in general. Uh, so, Thomas, thank you very much for joining us. Um, could you explain, first of all, a little bit what uh, Kraftwerk and, and you are doing? Yeah, sure. Thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, yeah, let's, let me start with introducing Kraftwerk to the people who don't know our company. Hopefully, that aren't that much. Uh, we are basically a system integra integrator. Kraftwerk Living Technology was founded in 1992, so close to uh, 30 years now. We have realized 500 projects. We do system integration on audiovisual system, uh, system in general. We have around 130 employees in our global network where our core our headquarter is located here in Austria and Wales. But we have global offices in Shanghai, Dubai, Moscow, and Johannesburg. So by that, uh, we, we are concentrating facing or generally on the global market uh, covering all sorts of media-based attraction, but also industry science, museum exhibition, corporate solution, and so on. So we even have uh, some sort of own, developed our own projects, products, in which are a little bit related to the typical core knowledge that we build up in due to the past projects where we are highly focusing on complex projection, giant screens, curved screens, all sort of immersive experience in the theme park world as an attraction, but also in science center and, uh, and so on. So like a hybrid dome, which is really complex dome screen as a combination, as a multi-purpose venue with a live stage in combination. We finished the project uh, two years ago in Germany using Barco projectors there. It's really an amazing space. Mm -hmm. um, we have motion technology, meaning motion platforms, also control of motion, uh, 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 emotion control, specifically in conjunction with media production, with the media itself. Synchronization is a very essential topic to make the experience high class and perfect and giving the people or the audience a, a, a that essential element to feel uh, or uh, not, that, not to get sick, let's say it in this way. Um, one of our core uh, knowledge or experience is our huge giant screens using multiple projectors, multi-channel applications, uh, huge audio system in combination uh, with uh, a large auditorium through in the theme park world where throughput is essential, uh, especially in China, these projects sometimes reach a scale beyond everything what we built before. Uh, but we also are doing projects like dark rides, small attractions, everything from lighting, audio, and of course video. And one really a uh, nice topic, what me personally, what I personally like a lot, are flying theatres. We did a lot of flying theatres, it's a sort of attraction that um, is now coming to theme parks in general as a, let's say, must-have attraction. It's giant screen, motion base in front of it, you have that sort of flying and media the quality of media is essential for this kind of uh, experience. So it should be some sort of photorealism using multiple high resolution projectors. So that's a general overview, I would say, about our company. And 
that okay. I think we would fit well here for this presentation. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Um, so when designing these cutting edge uh, attractions, which are going into theme parks, um, what are the what's the secret ingredient that makes it really a wow attraction? What is the thing that really brings people back uh, over and over to the theme park and makes them want to visit a theme park? There, there are multiple factors. <laughs> Uh, what makes it great? Technology, of course, is an essential factor, but technology alone doesn't make the point. So it is also essential that the story uh, uh, is engaging and the, so the overall experience it works well. So it starts from the initial design, having a good story, creating the, the right media, and then finding the right technology to present those kind of idea and media. So, um, so on those specifically media-based attraction on theme parks, um, immersive immersiveness for the audience is an important factor. So the immersive integration of the visitor is the key factor to get to make that experience a so-called wow factor. Uh, where a hyper reality or photorealism is also a, 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 um, a big elementary factor. Like a, a dark, like a flying theater, um, such or a media based attraction, like a 4D theater, is basically a simulation. And we try to, we try to beat uh, the reality making it even more out of it. So it's a virtual experience where all the small bits and pieces need to work in conjunction to make a big thing. Okay, so am I right in saying then we have to make it believable for the for the customer? Yes, we have to make it believable and or beyond that, uh, Best thing is the the customer goes out or and says, "How did they do it?" Okay. That if we achieve this, then we are in a good position. Okay, and uh, so I, I understand that it's the, it's really the complete story. Um, it's everything combined. But um, let's say that uh, we've decided for a particular ride that um, it really should be a projector, and uh, of course we as Barco hope that there will be many projector solutions. Um, if it would be a projector, um, to what extent does the resolution and the color reproduction uh, make the attraction believable? Uh, how is that uh, important in the whole chain? Oh, it's a very important factor. Because um, what, what I tried to express uh, up front was the immersive experience should give you the, the virtual simulation of something you never experienced before, but it should be believable. And by that, the image quality is an essential factor, not only because the audience, meanwhile, is used to high resolution, also on consumer devices. Uh, so we have to compete also as well in this level. Um, we are then in, um, in spaces where we have an immersive display from around 180 degree covering the, the full vision of the audience. And that, if you calculate based on the typical TV of 4K, this overall experience of that huge uh, 300, 400 square meter screen surface needs to be covered with the same amount of pixel. So we need multiple projectors to achieve that same or similar resolution. And those uh, projectors shall produce the native resolution that is achievable. And that's for in our perspective, uh, generally, 4K native, what we are aiming for, which is at currently the highest resolution we can achieve with a projector. Then yep. same comes with uh, um, the color, color space, color gamut. Uh, specifically, again, a, a, an immersive display, a dome or a spherical screen, uh, where we have to deal with cross reflection, with contra losing contrast ratio due to the reflection of the opposite side. The native a uh, uh, contrast ratio of the projector, of course, is essential. And so there comes the RGB light source, 
uh, uh, in play or as, a, as an essential factor. It generally it generates a higher color space, and by that, the perceived uh, color ratio is so much higher than you actually can measure, and that is the benefit that we have that it it. It is also perceived in a higher contrast ratio, which helps us specifically on the multi-channel system. So uh, we are really aiming for try to uh, specify our project with the best of the best in, the, in those regards, and that's in our point of view a 4K native projector with RGB light source. Okay. Um and I hear more and more uh, word in the industry about people wanting to go towards this so-called uh, REC 2020, uh, whereas in the past we've always worked towards uh, REC 709. Um, do you have an easy way of explaining what the advantages of moving towards REC 2020? I'm trying to say the easy, easiest is uh, put two projectors side by side REC 709 and REC 2020, and I think that you can't explain it in a better way than it's clear once you have experienced a REC 2020 projector, you think, why should I take the REC 709? Yeah. Even so see, it's seeing is believing. Yeah, seeing is believing. Okay. <laughs> and that's, uh, for, for us, it definitely it's essential. You have to, bet if you use multiple projectors in an application, you have to balance them and the higher your color uh, uh, gamut or your color spaces the better you can balance them to each other so you don't need to uh, you, you have to come to a common level in yes. of these components and they they higher they are and it's in their specification itself the better uh, the overall result can be achieved yeah and uh you also mentioned about uh, wanting uh, and needing to go to 4K native, which indeed is the highest uh, native resolution. But um, we've also had for some time uh, 4K UHD or wobbled 4K, as some people call it, or pixel shifting. Uh, there are lots of different words for the same thing. Um, why is it so important to have native 4K? Um... Of course, again, it, it, it depends on the application. If I have a high a wobbled project on a relatively small screen, I can accept the, the, the resolution, the outcome resolution of that, because I can't detect the individual picture, pixel. But if you have a display with a um, 30 meter wide screen, then every pixel counts, or even in a smaller space. But if your audience is close to the screen where pixels are nearly detectable because you want to create that huge display or immersive wide angle view. Um, every pixel counts and that means also the media producer that produces all this me uh, with the media, uh, he wants to have his pixel positioned at the correct place. And Using Wobblet projector, you can achieve quite a good result, but it is definitely a difference if you compare it to the native 4K once it, the media is produced accordingly. Yeah. Okay. And um, I think over the last uh, one and a half years, we've all experienced uh, hard times with the, the, the current COVID pandemic, which is uh, still ongoing uh, uh, in, in many places. We still see the effects. Um, can you give a view uh, fr from yours and Craftworks perspective? Do you see things getting better? Uh, do you see some positive signs of recovery within the different markets that we all operate in? Yes, definitely. So uh, it's like an awakening, I think, in the industry. Projects that were got on hold in the last year or two years come to life again, or at least we talk with the client again, and they are, they look positive that they can realize what they try to design and plan the years before. We have, luckily, we were in a position for, due to our global market that we covered the last year with a lot of completion of projects, ongoing projects, even if we had some challenges with travel restriction, but we were in the, luckily in the position to complete those things promised on time. 
So, um, meaning things are, that have been installed last year or this year will open. They open right now. We have some of the attraction that actually opened uh, last month, this month, and so on. So we see very positive signs. We have a lot of uh, getting a lot of RFIs, RFPs. So yeah, I think there's really a positive vibe uh, noticeable. Oh, that's good to hear. So Thomas, thank you very much for joining me today and giving me your giving us your insights. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much and uh, hope to see you soon. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Then bye. Bye. Ciao. So um, I hope the audio uh, enabled you to to follow that um, that uh, uh, interview uh, and that the insights were interesting. So moving on, um, Barco has a long history in cinema projection, and we've been a market leader in that uh, sector for quite a few years now. We have a long-standing technology heritage. We've got lots of laser technology expertise. And in fact, just yesterday, we celebrated here in the factory in Kortrijk the 100,000th cinema projector coming off the production line here. So there was uh, quite some festivities. Um, in innovation, we've been breaking ground with numerous industry firsts, and we introduced our first laser cinema projectors back in 2014 already. So Kun, um, why have we built these two new models, XDM and XDX, out of a cinema platform? And why is our cinema history relevant for this market? Well, the needs of the cinema market are quite similar to the needs of location-based entertainment owners and operators. The show must go on. The show must be amazing and inspire customers to come back for more. A good show spreads by word of mouth, social media and the news, and so more visitors come. Visitors are everything. Bums on seats in the cinema is just as important as bums on seats in a dark ride or a museum or a planetarium, but there's more. Over the past 10 to 15 years, cinemas have transitioned from 35 millimeter film to full digital technology. With this transition, we have seen a massive shift in the way they organize their companies. Previously, cinemas had projectionists on site in every theater to make sure that the film played out without hitch. Those projectionists not only laced up the films into the projectors, but they also carried out maintenance and cleaning on an ongoing basis. Now that everything is digital, cinema chains work with a skeleton staff. There are no projectionists. Everything is operated and controlled from a distance, from switching on the projector, ingesting new content into the media servers, putting together a playlist, including trailers and adverts, and starting the film on time in the correct theater. This is rather similar to location-based entertainment venues. They too are looking for operating efficiencies. Oli from Scallywag just told us that uptime and running costs are essential if they are to hit their return on investment targets. Long distance maintenance and self-sufficiency are increasingly important, especially now with travel restrictions. Equipment needs to last at minimum six to eight years. We can draw parallels between these two industries time and time again. Our leading position in cinema forced us and enabled us to be leading in laser light sources. The switch from lamps to laser has been very quick these past few years, and now Barco does not produce any more lamp-based projectors, which is a good thing for the images we see and also for our planet. And Barco didn't just specialize on one kind of laser, we mastered all kinds, laser phosphor, red-assisted laser phosphor, direct laser RGB, we choose the best technology for the application at hand and can implement it in the most durable, efficient and economical way. OK, so let's look at a bit more detail then in these two new models and uh, the reasons why someone might choose to go for an XDM or an XDX for their entertainment projects. So first up, a brilliant image. What makes the XDM and XDX different from the other projectors that we've got in our range? Uh, we've got other projectors in live events and uh, some other sectors. Why can't we just stick with those? Well, simply different technology. Direct red, green and blue lasers enhance the color gamut. We heard earlier from Thomas at Kraftwerk how this improved color range 
giving more punchy colors increases the overall contrast impression, especially in multi-projector blended setups. Plus, native 4K resolution in combination with high-quality lenses gives the great real-life detail that experiences need. Remember, Thomas said, every pixel counts. Thanks to the superior light source, Barco Colorgenic technology and the new projector design, XDM and XDX projectors achieve greater than 98% of the REC 2020 color space. To create those exceptional striking colors and contrast levels without losing brightness. The projector is designed in such a way that when using the REC 2020 color mode, there's only a slight reduction compared to the maximum native brightness. Next to this, the projectors are very efficient with a stunning 10 lumen per watt. You said seeing is believing when talking to Thomas. I think that's absolutely right. Okay, so we're launching two models, the XDM 4K25 and the XDX 4K40. Two brightness levels, 25 and 40,000 lumens. What else can you tell us about them? Well, another interesting point is the way we have been able to limit speckle. It ensures brilliant, highly uniform images on all screen types, even on high gain screens, where this is particularly troubling. The technology guarantees consistent image quality over time and precision brightness with white balance. Okay, but for us non-engineers listening, um, what exactly is speckle and why does it occur? Well, speckle is the grainy interference you see on the screen when using a laser pointer, for instance. This is caused by the nature of the lasers. Laser light is coherent, and when it falls onto a surface, the reflected rays and the incoming rays are causing an interference pattern on your eyes, which is the grainy pattern you see. The used techniques inside the projector are all aimed at reducing the coherence of the laser beams to make sure the light coming out of the lens is not causing that interference patterns anymore. So our second pillar um, is all about uh, cost-effective investment. Uh, you've got 40,000 hours written up there. Uh, why is that? Well, coming back to the cinema industry again, they operate on average 4,000 hours a year. That's about 11 hours a day. Being able to keep a projector operational for 40,000 hours with minimal interventions means that operators can count on at least 10 years of cost-effective service lifetime. We heard from Oli at Scallywag that operators look for 8 to 10 years of operational lifetime so we're confident that we have a product that can exceed their expectations. Careful component selection at Barco means that these projectors are designed to operate more than 40,000 hours if specified correctly for the application. The projectors can also withstand environmental variations like temperature and dust thanks to the superior cooling and the air filtration design. With the Barco EcoPure technology, we introduce smart power options. The projector both produce about 10 lumen per watt. This is thanks to the very efficient optical design and the coatings we put on our glass components. In eco standby mode, both models only consume an ultra low power of 3 watts. So increasingly important is the environmental footprint of our products. Uh, so to be sustainable, uh, everybody's talking about it. And um, how do these products stack up in terms of the environmental? Well. Barco values transparency and therefore we want to communicate openly about the environmental footprint of our products. Unfortunately, there is no single industry standard by which to measure and evaluate projection products. So Barco has developed our own objective tool that grades our products according to their eco-design performance. These standards or criteria can be viewed by everyone at the web address on the screen now. This gives customers an overview of environmental performance, and forces also developers in Barco to make sustainable choices. The framework that has been used to validate the EcoScoring is based upon the ISO 14021 standard. The EcoScoring tool focuses on four domains that have the highest impact on the product environmental footprint. Energy, materials, packaging and logistics, and end of life. Both XDM and XDX received an A score, and this has been independently validated by Ernst & Young.
That's good. So now the last element to consider, uh, operational efficiency. We've already talked about the projectors being cost effective from an investment point of view. So what do we mean exactly by operational efficiency? Of course, operational efficiency also contributes to make the projectors a cost effective investment. But here we specifically talk about operating the projectors over their entire lifetime. So both projectors are designed with maintenance and efficiency at heart. Modularity is important for the uptime management of your venue. Any trained and certified technician can replace a module locally, so you don't need to send it back to repair centers. Individual laser plates can be replaced to restore brightness levels. The projectors have reduced maintenance interventions, meaning less frequent checks and less costs. For instance, the filters are washable and can be reused. The projectors are also delivered with a sturdy frame around them. This allows the projectors to be handled easily, fixed into position and provides protection to the body parts. Together with the large lens range, including ultra short row and high contrast models, the XDM and XDX can truly meet any setup challenge. Another unique feature is our projector management suite. This allows service people, owners, to proactively monitor the health conditions of our projectors and proactively plan for maintenance cycles to save time and costs. A simple internet connection to the projectors without any additional hardware or software and without a complex setup procedure means that the running data from the projector can be accessed anywhere, anytime, on any device, securely. And it can even be easily integrated through API with your own tools and current processes. But what if the, the customer is rather sensitive and he doesn't want uh, his install base connected to the cloud? That's no problem. You can choose whether or not you connect your projectors. The owner of the, of the equipment is in charge. So that's the XDM and XDX. There are many more technical details and specifications. They're all available on our website. Um, you can go to www.barco.com slash products slash installation projectors, uh, but we'll let you read those in your own time afterwards. Uh, in order to give you a better look at the new models, we put together the follow video clip. So let's watch that now, and then we'll come back for some uh, live questions. So I think we're going to be joined by uh, Ollie um, from Scallywag and also Kevin Murphy from uh, Craftwork Living Technologies. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, Kevin is here because, uh, unfortunately, Thomas couldn't, couldn't join us due to uh, previous commitments. Uh, so thankfully, uh, we had the recorded video of him earlier. Um, thanks for joining me, gentlemen. Um, are there any questions coming into the comments section? Looks like we've got a few uh, a few technical ones, probably more for uh, Kevin than, uh, than Cohen. Yeah. Uh, so uh, first question here, maybe this one for you, Kuhn. Um, are these projectors capable of uh, showing uh, content in 3D? Uh, yes, they are. They can show 3D active and passive up to 4K at 60 hertz. Okay. Everyone being a little bit shy on asking the questions in the chat panel. Well, there's a there's a few questions there. I can see. Uh, can you? Uh -huh. 
uh, well, one of them is what was the most technically challenging entertainment project for you and why? So that's probably aimed at us to a certain extent. Yes. Because I'm definitely not Thomas Gellerman, who's incredibly clever. And that's one of the things for me. I used to design uh, technical systems. But since I joined Craftwork, from a technical point of view, the guys are exceedingly capable. So I focus on the commercial relationships and management. But um, what I can say uh, very, very quickly is that the probably the most challenging project that we've ever worked on, and one of the largest, not the very largest, is actually the... Um, the Saudi Arabian Pavilion that, that's going to open in uh, Dubai 2020 on the 1st of October. It's a huge pavilion. I think it's the second largest pavilion on site. Technology plays a major part um, from the outside right the way through. And it uses virtually everything you can imagine, a lot of LED, uh, a lot of projection. Uh, I know we're using quite a lot of F90s in there in various spaces. We have complex curve LED. In other words, curved in two directions with domes. And it's actually already won um, uh, or been allocated three Guinness World Records, one of them for the largest interactive lighting installation and a second for a, a mirrored LED, which our guys basically designed and built with the rest of the team. So that's one to keep an eye open for in October. Fantastic. Um, you're right, I can see the questions now, so that's good. The, the, the system is working. Uh, another question for you, Kuhn. Uh, what about warping and blending for the XDX and XDM? There is no warping and blending uh, inside XDX and XDM, so it has to be done in the media server. Okay, clear. And then a follow-up question. Um, is it also usable in the rental and staging market? Uh, no, it's not. It's for fixed installs. So it can be used in all orientations, but for fixed installations. Okay. Um, there's one question here. I think you already answered it, but maybe we'll just put it again. Um, are there UST, ultra short throw lens options for these projectors? Yes, uh, they uh, have, both of them have a 0 0.38, 90 degree angled uh, lens uh, in their portfolio. Okay, um, the next one down. Um, has Barco considered remote laser light source modules to drive these projectors? Um, no. Uh, so we uh, use the, the internal laser light sources because uh, they are more efficient. You have less loss when uh, using uh, remote uh, lasers. So that's why we chose for internal lasers. Okay, uh, another one from the audience. Um, projectors have developed massively over the last decade. How do you see them evolving over the next decade? Uh, maybe Kevin can give us his view on that one as well. No, it sounds too technical for me, but to a certain extent, <laughs> I mean, it's incredible how they've moved. Um, uh, I think I probably started using projectors in the 90s and look at them now. Um, there's a lot of questions out there also about LED and the impact on the projection market. Certainly from our point of view, projectors are here to stay for a very, very long time. They can do things that we can't do with LED. It's, to, it's, it's another tool. How are they going to develop? I think I'd almost bounce that back to you guys to a certain extent, because as Thomas explained, we, we specialize in multiple pixel installations using multiple projectors. So we're quite comfortable with blending and warping to virtually any size or shape. So, you know, even touching on high resolution projectors or high brightness, those are not the issues for us. We've already got a large number of tools that we can utilize. Um, but uh, what do you guys think? I'll let Kuhn, the product manager, answer that one. Well, uh, it, it's like you said, uh, Kevin, that projectors can be used in situations where LEDs cannot be used, for instance, on large projection mapping, on, uh, on uh, curved structures. Uh, there it's, it's much harder on, on existing buildings to, uh, to use LEDs. Um, so projectors, they do have some, uh, some benefits. They also are producing less heat they are more effective more cost effective uh, as a solution they are very versatile for uh, reusing them on, on different uh, setups so they do have some uh, some specific advantages which 
for instance, LEDs or other technologies don't have. Yeah, I think I would add that I agree with you, Kevin. I think projectors indeed are here to stay. Um, they're not going to go away because of LED. There are some applications that absolutely can only be done with projectors. And and, uh, and I think definitely solid state uh, powered projectors uh, uh, are also clearly the way to go. Um, we've now stopped producing all lamp projectors. Uh, there's no more lamp projectors within our family. So um, yeah, it's... Uh, it, it will things will only continue to get more efficient well the entertainment market is growing and growing so there's a wider audience or, or, or a number of clients looking for applications anyway so that we've got a long long way to go so the market will grow and the volume of projection okay um there is a question here um so do the onboard electronics enable multi-view 3d stereo capabilities and if so, do you see future attractions incorporating this feature to have different split audience experiences? Well, the XDM and XDX do not have the multi-view 3D stereo capabilities. Um, however, like UDX uh, has this uh, function in there. Um, so yeah, it, not, not on XDM, XDX, but on, uh, on other machines we have. Did you want to add something there, Kevin? No, I think that's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, question here for Ollie. Um, did the tech trends vary around the world with your research? Uh, were there any differences between Asia, Europe, North America? Um, did everybody react in the same way? Um, not significant differences. Um, the differences, uh, were probably more relating to the companies. Um, so different cultures uh, within the companies, different budgets um, and uh, different ways of getting projects approved and things like that. So um, companies with multiple sites across the world in different geographies tended to run things in a similar way across those geographies. Um, but we didn't see any major differences in trends between, between markets. Um, having said that, I, you know, I think we have to uh, acknowledge that the most of the companies we were talking to, even if they had projects in, um, let's say, developing markets in Asia or South America and so on, um, they tended to be uh, Western companies uh, and regular, most of them were regular clients of, of Barco, um, not all of them though. Um, we didn't necessarily uh, speak to lots of local uh, operators in in China, for example, or uh, and so on. So, um, you know, I think if we dug deeper, um, there might be some trends at a more local level that we might identify. But certainly, those international companies with uh, across multiple markets, not not significant differences. Okay, um, I think we've just about used up the hour. Um, so I would like to end by thanking you gentlemen very, very much for joining us and for, for making this launch webinar what it was, for giving us your insights. And uh, thank you everybody for joining online and I hope that you found it interesting.